trach substitution can be super tricky because there are just a lot of steps to follow, which means there's a lot of different opportunities to make mistakes on small details. But don't worry because I've got a few tricks to help you stay organized that'll make trig sub problems a whole lot easier. So if you're ready to finally understand what trig substitution actually is, how it works and when you should use it, and how to easily solve any trig sub problem that gets thrown at you, then you're definitely in the right place. So what is trig substitution? Well, it's just like these other rules for integration, like power rule, U substitution, or just substitution, integration by parts, and partial fractions. So we've already learned all of these rules, and these are different things that we use to help us evaluate integrals. For example, if we have a really simple integral, like the integral of x cubed plus x squared, we can just use power rule to evaluate that integral. We know how to do that. If we have something a little more complicated, we might need to use substitution, or if we have the product of two functions for our integrand, then we might need to use integration by parts, or if we have a rational function, then we might need to use partial fractions. All of these methods just help us integrate different kinds of functions, and trig substitution is no different. It's another method that we can use to find the value of an integral, and it works for specific kinds of functions, just like these work for specific kinds of functions. So that kind of brings us to the question then, when do we want to use trig substitution? Well, there's two parts really to that answer. The first part is you want to use trig substitution when these other rules don't work. Now, the reason that you look at these rules first is because they're all generally simpler than trig substitution. So if I could use power rule to evaluate an integral, I would certainly rather do that rather than using trig substitution because it's gonna be easier and faster. And same thing goes for substitution, integration by parts, and partial fractions. If I can use one of these methods, it's probably gonna be easier and quicker than using trig substitution, which is a little complicated. That means that I wanna go through a mental checklist of these other methods of integration before I would use trig substitution. So I wanna kinda of look at my integral and think, can I use power rule? No, okay, I can't use substitution. Can't use integration by parts because it's not the product of two functions. Can't use partial fractions because it's not a rational function. So at this point now, I've kind of ruled these out. Maybe I wanna think about trig substitution and look at my integral and see if I might be able to apply this method. So what kinds of integrals are you looking for? Well, you're looking for things like this. Here, I've got three examples of integrals that you would apply trigonometric substitution to in order to solve them. So what you wanna be on the lookout for is a couple of things. First of all, we have to have one of these forms inside of our integral. We have to have a squared minus u squared, u squared plus a squared or a squared plus u squared or u squared minus a squared. Now you might be like, what the heck are you talking about? a squared, u squared, I don't get it. All this means, think of a as a constant and u as a variable. So for example, if a were four, then four squared is 16. So this a squared term is always going to be a constant number, meaning a constant has no variable attached to it. So like 16, 16, seven, those are constants. U squared though is gonna be a variable. So think of U like the variable X. So U could be X such that this is X squared. U could be two X such that when I square two X, I get four X squared. U is just gonna be something that involves X. So when you say A squared minus U squared, really think of this as a constant minus a variable. So here's a perfect example. Inside of this first integral, I have a constant 16 minus a variable x squared. This is a constant term, this is a variable term, and I'm looking for a squared minus u squared constant minus variable, and here I have constant minus variable. So that's what we mean when we say a squared minus u squared, and of course we could also have any of these forms. So u squared plus a squared would be like a variable plus a constant. And remember, because addition is commutative, u squared plus a squared is really the same thing as a squared plus u squared. They're just flipped around. 
It's no different than if I had 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3. Those are both 7. It's just that the order is flipped around. So these two things mean the same thing. So I could be looking for variable plus constant or constant plus variable. And then the third form, which would be the only other possibility, would be variable term minus constant term, u squared minus a squared. So I'm looking for one of those four relationships somewhere in my integral. The only time I can do trig substitution is if I have one of these four relationships or I might be able to do a little manipulation with my integral to get it into one of these forms so that I can then do trig substitution. So I'm looking for one of those forms and for example here we have constant minus variable 16 minus x squared which matches this form of a squared minus u squared because it's also constant minus variable. Ideally, I want both of these values to be perfect squares. So for example, 16 is the perfect square of four, it's four squared. And x squared is the perfect square of x, so this is x squared. So because these are both perfect squares, I could match this up 4 squared minus x squared, I could match that to a squared minus u squared and easily say that a has got to be 4 and u has to be x. So that's kind of a perfect match for this a squared minus u squared, so that's a dead giveaway for trig substitution. Same thing here in the second integral, I have x to the fourth a variable term plus 16 the constant term. And that's just like u squared plus a squared variable plus constant. And furthermore, if I look at these two values, they're also perfect squares. x to the fourth is a perfect square of x squared. So I would get x squared squared, and 16 is the perfect square of four, so this is four squared. So I could easily say that u is x squared, and that a is four, and this format here matches u squared plus a squared. So we're looking for those kinds of relationships inside of our integral somewhere. Another dead giveaway is if you have a square root inside of your integral like this here. We have this square root, we have this square root, and especially when you have one of these relationships, a squared minus u squared, one of these u squared plus a squared or a squared plus u squared, or a u squared minus a squared underneath your square root sign, that is a dead giveaway for trig substitution and you should probably strongly consider using it. Now there's a couple of caveats to that. First of all, our integral doesn't have to have a square root sign in order to be a trig substitution problem. For example, this second integral is a trig substitution problem, but you'll notice no square root. So it doesn't have to be there, it's just an obvious sign that it might be a trig substitution problem. The second caveat is, in these first two examples, we had perfect squares. Both of these values here worked out to perfect squares, 4 squared, x squared, x squared, quantity squared, 4 squared. But like in this example, this is a trig substitution problem. And we have this u squared minus a squared relationship, but these are not both perfect squares. This turns out to be a perfect square x squared, but 7 is not a perfect square. So you might think, oh, this can't be a trig substitution problem because seven's not a perfect square. Well, that's not true. This is a trig substitution problem. The way you get around your constant not being a perfect square is you say, well, seven actually is a perfect square of the square root of seven. So you say square root of seven squared like this. And so then if you were matching this up to your u squared minus a squared, then u would be equal to x and a would just be the square root of seven. So my point is that a trig substitution problem must have one of these relationships inside of it between a and u, but a squared might not always be a perfect square like we saw here. And especially if you have a square root in your integral, that's even more evidence that this is probably a trig sub problem, but you don't necessarily have to have a square root in order for it still to be trigonometric substitution. So before we continue on, let's take a look at a bunch of trig sub examples so that we can see what these problems typically look like. 
So here are a bunch of examples. These are all trigonometric substitution problems. On the left here, these are all sine substitutions, and we'll talk more about what this means in a little bit. These in the middle here are all tangent substitutions, and these on the right are all secant substitutions. So if you look here on the left, you'll notice this common theme of a squared minus u squared. We have here an a squared minus a u squared, two perfect squares, the difference of two perfect squares where we have constant minus variable. We have constant minus variable, two perfect squares, and both of those a squared minus u squared values are underneath square root signs, so dead giveaways for a sign substitution. This one though, not so much. This is just a quadratic under a square root, so the fact that the square root is there would maybe make you think trig substitution, but you see no perfect square here. So here's the trick when you see something like this. Trig substitution you often use when you have quadratics. This is a quadratic where you have the negative x squared plus 2x plus 48, the x squared term, the x to the first term, and the constant. So that's a quadratic. And when you have that, oftentimes you'll use trig substitution. What you want to do is take this quadratic and you want to go through the process of completing the square. You want to complete the square for this quadratic because when you do that, what you'll end up with is this form here of a squared minus u squared. And so you'll essentially turn this into a trig substitution problem because when you rewrite this quadratic under the square root and you change it into a perfect square, you'll have this a squared minus u squared format. If we look at these tangent substitutions, notice here the pattern of either a squared plus u squared or u squared plus a squared. So here we have a u squared plus a squared, but notice no square root sign, just this value inside parentheses, and then we're squaring that whole quantity. Even though we don't have a square root sign, this is still a trig sub problem. This one's perfect because we have an a squared plus a u squared, constant plus a variable, and we have the square root sign, so that one's really obvious. But these two, again, not quite as obvious. This one, same thing as before, this is a quadratic, the x squared plus 4x plus 5, that common form. It's a quadratic. We need to go through the process of completing the square to turn this into a perfect square such that you have a u squared plus a squared format, and it becomes a trig sub problem. Even this problem here, this one looks really crazy, and I don't want to freak you out with it, but the point here, what I'm trying to show you, is that you can have all different kinds of functions inside your integral, and they could still be a trigonometric substitution problem. This one, what you actually end up doing, is this is a u substitution problem. So you use u substitution first on this. Once you do that, it turns into a partial fractions problem. And so then you go through the process of partial fractions, you do your partial fractions decomposition, and at the end of that, what you end up with is this format here, u squared plus a squared, and it actually at that point becomes a trigonometric substitution problem. And again, you don't need to worry about that. You rarely deal with problems this complicated. My point is only that you may have to, like with these quadratics or something like this, go through one of the other methods and then apply trigonometric substitution. So if you're working through a problem and you're doing another method and it's working and going well, and then you get to a point midway through solving your integral and you realize all of a sudden you have a trig substitution problem, that's not a bad sign. It's just a sign that now you need to transition to trigonometric substitution and start applying this process after some work that you've already done. So it can pop up in the middle of a problem. And then this last set of examples here, these are all secant substitutions in the form u squared minus a squared. You see the variable minus constant, both perfect squares. Underneath the square root sign, classic, classic trig sub. Or here, u squared minus a squared, variable minus constant. Yes, it's cubed, but it has that format and it's underneath the square root. Perfect trig substitution problem. And then here, this example, similar to these other two that we talked about, this is a quadratic. It needs to be factored using the process of completing the square. And once that's done, it will become a trig sub problem.
with a secant substitution because you'll have the form u squared minus a squared. That value will be underneath the square root. It'll be perfect for trig sub. Now, why does trig sub actually work? Well, this is a little bit of a simplified explanation, but I want to give you a better intuition for why this works. So we're going to go through this briefly, and then we're going to talk about how to actually solve trig sub problems. So if I start by drawing a right triangle, and I make this a right triangle, and I say that this is the angle theta here. Remember that any method of integration, whether it's u substitution, integration by parts, partial fractions, trigonometric substitution, all these things that we use, all we're trying to do is rewrite the integrand, where we're trying to rewrite the function so that it turns into something we can actually integrate because we're given all these integrals that we can't integrate directly. And so we use these methods to manipulate the functions, rewrite them, change them around into a different form, still the same value, but a different form so that we can actually integrate it with a simpler method like power rule. So trig substitution is no different. We're just trying to simplify our integrals. And remember, we had all these examples of integrals that were perfect for trig sub that had these values inside them, the a squared minus u squared, u squared minus a squared, one of these relationships inside of them. Well, the reason that this works is because we look for that relationship and then we want to replace that relationship with something simpler. And that's how we end up simplifying our integral. So why can we replace values like these? Well, it comes back to the Pythagorean theorem for right triangles. So remember that the Pythagorean theorem says that if you have a side here, this is the adjacent side, this is the opposite side of the angle theta, and then this is the hypotenuse C, that the relationship between these sides is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, an interesting thing that happens here, if I, for example, wanted to solve for the length of side A, and I wanted to use the Pythagorean theorem, let's pretend that I knew that the length of the hypotenuse was 4 and that the length of the opposite side here was x. Well, in that case, if I plug into my Pythagorean theorem, I get A squared plus, I know B is x, so I get x squared and I know that C, the hypotenuse, is 4, so I get 4 squared or 16. Now, if I subtract x squared from both sides because I'm trying to solve for A, I get 16 minus x squared. And then if I take the square root of both sides, I get A is equal to the square root of 16 minus x squared. Now, here's the interesting thing. Remember all those integrals that we looked at where I said, like, these are all perfect examples of trig sub problems? Well, didn't they look a lot like this value right here, the square root of 16 minus x squared? They did. Remember I was saying the square root sign is a dead giveaway. We would have a relationship between values like this, constant minus variable. This is a perfect 4 squared minus x squared, or we could call it a squared minus u squared, right, which is this a squared minus u squared that we use for assigned substitution. So the point here is that trigonometric substitution works. The reason why it works is because we're given a value like this, square root of 16 minus x squared inside of our integral. Well, if we can relate that back to a right triangle, if we can sort of undo this Pythagorean theorem process, what we realize is that this value is related to a few other values. It's related to the angle theta. It's related to the length of the hypotenuse 4. And it's related to the length of the opposite side, x. All of which, if I think about theta, 4, and x, all of which are a lot simpler than this square root of 16 minus x squared. So the point is that if I start out with something like square root of 16 minus x squared, I can sort of work backwards, get to these values of theta, 4, and x, and I can end up replacing this value inside of my integral with something that's maybe in terms of theta or with something involving 4 or x, a simpler value than what I originally started with, which overall is going to make my integral a lot easier to solve. So that's why trigonometric substitution actually works, 
because you're relating a value that you're given in your integral to these associated components inside a right triangle, and that allows you to simplify that function that you're trying to integrate. So now that we know how this actually works, let's talk about how to solve a trig sub problem. So when we're talking about solving a trigonometric substitution problem, the first thing we wanna do is go through the same setup process every single time. And the reason that we wanna do this is because we have lots of little values that we're gonna to need to use throughout our problem. So we wanna get them all out in the open up front instead of having to pause our work as we're going through the integral to find each one of these little pieces. We wanna get them all done first thing. That way we'll be prepared to just go through the rest of our problem smoothly. So with that being said, remember before we had talked about sine, tangent, and secant. Those are the substitutions we're gonna be making. So when you talk about trig substitution, you can make a sine substitution, a tangent substitution, or a secant substitution. And the reason that we call it that is because when you're doing a sine substitution, your substitution is built off of this u equals a sine theta value, where u and a come from the a squared minus u squared that we find inside our integral. And a tangent substitution comes from u equals a tangent theta, secant comes from u equals a secant theta. So that's why we call it a sine substitution or a tangent substitution. But let's quickly go through this setup process so that you know what you're doing and you start getting comfortable setting up for a trig sub problem. So let's pretend that you found this value inside your integral, the square root of one minus x squared. Well, the first thing you see right away is that you have constant minus variable, one minus x squared, constant minus variable. That matches your a squared minus u squared format. So you wanna match those formats together and you wanna say a squared has to be equal to one and u squared has to be equal to x squared. Then you wanna take the square root of both of those to get a and u. So the square root of one is still one and the square root of x squared is x. So we get a equals one and u equals x. Now we wanna plug those into our sine substitution u equals a sine theta. So since u is equal to x and a equals one, we get x equals one sine theta or simply just x equals sine theta. So we say down here, x is equal to sine theta. And if this isn't already solved for x, we wanna go ahead and do that. But in this case, it is. So we have x equals sine theta. Then we wanna find dx, which is the derivative of x. So we say the derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. So we get cosine theta, and then we always wanna remember here on the right side to put d theta. Now for sine theta here, what we're doing is we're solving this equation for just the trig function. In this case, it already is because a was equal to one. So we just ended up with sine theta on the right hand side. That won't always be the case. And if it's not, you wanna make sure to solve this for just the trig function sine theta. So we get, in this case, sine theta equals x. And then what we wanna do is we want to solve this equation for just theta. So the way we do that is we take arc sine or the inverse sine function of both sides because arc sine of sine, those things will cancel out, leaving us with just theta on the left side. So we get theta is equal to arc sine of x. Now that was kind of a lot to do at once, but after we do two more examples, you'll really start to get the hang of it. So let's look at a tangent substitution here and pretend that inside of our integral, we found 4x squared plus 9. So when we look at that, we see u squared plus a squared because this was variable plus constant, so u squared plus a squared. So if we compare that to u squared plus a squared, then what we can say is that u squared has to be 4x squared and that a squared has to be nine. Then we wanna take the square root of both those values. So the square root of nine is three and the square root of 4x squared, square root of four is two. The square root of x squared is x. So we get two x for u. Now we wanna plug these into our formula u equals a tan theta so in our case, we get 2x equals 3 tan theta. 
And in this case, this equation is not solved for x. And remember we said we always wanted it to be solved for x. So we divide both sides by two to get x equals three halves tangent theta. Then we wanna take the derivative of that to get dx. So the derivative of tangent of theta is secant squared of theta. So we get dx is equal to three halves secant squared theta d theta. Then we also want to solve x equals 3 halves tangent theta for tangent theta specifically, which we can do by multiplying both sides of this by 2 thirds. So tangent of theta is 2x over 3. And then we take arctan of both sides to get theta equals arctan of 2x over 3. And then let's do this one more time. If we have in our integral the square root of x squared minus 25, what we see is variable minus constant. And that matches u squared minus a squared. So u squared has to be x squared. And a squared has to be 25. So we square root both of those and we get a is equal to square root of 25 or 5. And u is equal to the square root of x squared. Or x. Then we plug both of these into u equals a secant theta and we get x equals 5 secant theta. We're already solved for x so we're done there and then we take the derivative to get dx. So the derivative of secant theta is secant times tangent so we get 5 secant theta tangent theta d theta and then we want to solve this equation, x equals 5 secant theta, just for secant theta. So we'll divide both sides by 5 to get secant theta equals x over 5. And then we take arc secant of both sides to get theta is equal to arc secant of x over 5. So now that we understand this setup process, let's go through one trigonometric substitution so that we can talk about the steps involved in solving a trig subproblem and how to go through this setup process again. So if we have, for example, this problem, we have one divided by x squared times the square root of four minus x squared dx. So we look at this and right away, we can see that this looks like a trigonometric substitution problem because we have constant minus variable and they're both perfect squares and they're even underneath the square root sign. So remember, that's a dead giveaway. This is probably a trig subproblem. So if we match this up, the four minus x squared, that's constant minus variable, which means that's an a squared minus u squared. And that is actually a sign substitution where we know we're gonna have u equals a sine theta. So our first step in any trig subproblem is to, number one, identify that it is actually a trig subproblem, and we did that. Number two is to figure out which trig substitution to use. Is it a sine substitution, a tangent substitution, or a secant substitution? We found four minus x squared, constant minus variable. We matched that up to constant minus variable, a squared minus u squared, and we know because we memorized it that a squared minus u squared is a sine substitution and therefore that our substitution will be u equals a sine theta. Step three then is to go through the setup process like we just did in those last three examples. So the setup process, we're gonna match all these values up to our four minus x squared. So four, the constant has to be a squared and x squared has to be u squared. Then we wanna take the square root of both of those. So u is equal to x and a is equal to two. Then since we want u equals a sine theta, and we know u is x and a is two, we get x equals two sine theta. So x equals two sine theta. This is already solved for x, so we're good there. Then we wanna take the derivative of that, and remember the derivative of sine is cosine, so we get two cosine theta, and we don't forget our d theta. Then we wanna solve x equals two sine theta for just the trig function. So we divide both sides by two and we get sine theta is x over two 
And then we want to solve this for theta by taking arc sine of both sides to get theta is arc sine of x over 2. That's how quick the setup process can be. Now our fourth step is to take all this information that we found and actually make substitutions into our integral. So we're going to take these values, we're going to plug into our integral, and the goal here is to completely transform this integral. Right now it's in terms of x everywhere. We have x squared, x squared, dx. We want to get rid of all the x's and instead end up with only theta. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at this here. If we have the integral, the one will stay in the numerator because we're only trying to replace the x's. So we have that. x squared here, remember we found that the value of x was 2 sine theta. So we can plug that in here for x. So we get 2 sine theta, and because we have x squared, we square that. And then we have the square root of 4 minus, and then again we plug in for x, 2 sine theta quantity squared, and that's all going to be underneath our square root. And then we have to replace dx, which we know is 2 cosine theta d theta. So we can multiply here by 2 cosine theta d theta. Notice now that we have actually completely transformed the integral. Everything here is in terms of theta. There are no x's remaining, which is perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to do. So we're done with that step. The next step is just to simplify this integral as much as we can down to a point where we can actually evaluate the integral. And as we go through this process, we may have to use some trigonometric identities to make this simpler. We may have to use some other methods of integration, but we're trying to get to a point where we have a function that's simple enough that we can integrate it directly. So how will we do that? We can start by simplifying here in the denominator. So for example, if we look at just the square root here, we have the square root of 4 minus, we are squaring 2 sine squared. So 2 sine squared, quantity squared, turns into 4 sine squared theta. That's all underneath our square root. So let's go ahead and cancel as we go. So we're replacing that. Then, underneath the square root, we can factor out a 4. So this becomes 4 times 1 minus sine squared theta underneath our square root. Now at this point, what we recognize is that we have 1 minus sine squared theta this is where the first trigonometric identity comes in. So we want to remember the trig identity sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. If we subtract sine from both sides, we get cosine squared theta is equal to 1 minus sine squared theta. And 1 minus sine squared theta is exactly what we have, which means that we can replace it with cosine squared theta. So this becomes 4 times cosine squared theta underneath our square root sign. Now, of course, the square root of 4 cosine squared theta, the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of cosine squared is just cosine. So this becomes then 2 cosine theta, and we get rid of the entire square root and everything underneath it. Now, if we go ahead and move this up, underneath here, what we see then is that we can cancel a 2 cosine theta from the numerator and denominator. So this is going to cancel with this. So this integral becomes 1 over 4 sine squared theta d theta. This is where our next trig identity comes in, and it's a reciprocal identity. So remember that cosecant is the same as 1 over sine because sine and cosecant are reciprocals of one another. So whenever we have 1 over sine, that's the same thing as cosecant. So here we have 1 over sine squared, which means we can change that to cosecant squared. So this becomes the integral of 1 fourth cosecant squared of theta d theta. And at this point, we're lucky because we actually already know the integral of cosecant squared of theta. It's a common trig integral. The integral of this value is negative cotangent of theta. 
So what we can say is that this is going to be equal to negative one-fourth cotangent of theta plus c. And at this point, we've actually managed to evaluate the integral. Our last step at this point is to get this value back in terms of x. Remember, we started with an integral that was in terms of x, but this value is still in terms of theta. We need to put it back so that it's in terms of x. So the way that we always do that is we draw a reference triangle back to the right triangle like we did before. So let's go ahead and do that. We want to draw a right triangle for reference. We always put theta here, the right angle here. So now what we need to remember is that building this reference triangle, we already have back at the beginning of the problem, sine of theta is equal to x over 2. This is the last piece that we need to remember from our trigonometric identities. And it's that old phrase, you might remember, Sokotoa, which reminds you that sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, that cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, and that tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. So in this case, we have sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. We have sine of theta is equal to x over 2. So if we equate that to opposite over hypotenuse, then when we look at our angle theta, we say that the opposite side has to be x, opposite has to be x, hypotenuse has to be 2. So the opposite side has to be x, the hypotenuse has to be 2, and then we can solve for the length of this third side. We do that using Pythagorean theorem again. So if we call this side a, then we get with Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus x squared equals 2 squared or 4. And then we solve this for a. So a squared is 4 minus x squared. And then a is the square root of 4 minus x squared. So the third side then is square root of 4 minus x squared. Now why did we build that reference triangle? Well the reason is because we're trying to get negative 1 fourth cotangent of theta plus c back in terms of x. And in order to find the value of cotangent of theta, we need our reference triangle. So what we need to remember is that tangent is equal to sine over cosine, always. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, which means that if tangent is sine over cosine, then cotangent is the reciprocal. It's cosine over sine. So when we transform this value, we want negative one-fourth, and then we want cosine over sine. Well, cosine of the angle theta, going back to Sokotoa, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine is the adjacent side here over the hypotenuse two. So we're going to multiply this by square root four minus x squared over two. But then for cotangent, we're dividing that by sine. So we're dividing this whole thing by sine. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So opposite over hypotenuse, x over two, which remember we already had here, sine of theta is x over two. So we get x over two and then plus c. And then finally, we simplify this. Instead of dividing by the fraction x over two, we can multiply by its reciprocal, multiply by two over x instead of x over two. Our twos cancel, two and two here, which means that our final answer is negative square root of four minus x squared, all divided by four x and then plus c. I hope that video helped you. And if it did, hit that like button, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.